Allied to St. Thomas Mount, but on the southern side of the Madras airport is its sister locality, Palavram. Like St. Thomas Mount, Palavram has had a long association with the military and its cantonment. The pioneers of artillery in India, one, two, three and four batteries were raised at Palavram. So my dad was a gunner. Then he used to talk so much. It took me time to get embedded and to really like the artillery. Anyway, I joined the army. I did my training in the OTA and I wanted to join the infantry. But like, you know, God directed me to go into the artillery. The Anglo-Indian homes here consist of picture postcard bungalows arranged in a neat grid in a colony called Veteran Lines. Each house had a huge compound. Each house had an outhouse. And there was uh, any amount of space for us to, you know, do whatever. And these outhouses were used as storehouses? No, most often it was used for uh, domestic help. They would stay in the outhouses. And uh, that was mainly in, in Veteran Lines. Veteran Lines is you know, an old uh, British uh, army garrison, right? And the Anglo settled down there many years ago. And we had about 200 plus Anglo families here at that time, like. And it was Veteran Lines 1, Veteran Lines 2, Veteran Lines 3. You cross the road, it's officers in 1, 2, 3, 4. So, and who stayed in these lines? Who stayed in officers' lines? Who stayed in veteran lines? They were all Anglo units. The whole veteran lines, officers' lines, and uh, veteran lines were all Anglo units only. Just a very few of the other communities. Mr. Anthony de Nazareth is the oldest Anglo Indian in the area and one who is still busy for his age. Yeah, I want to do, is do my sweeping and cleaning the garden, yeah? See to the house, cleaning, cobbler, yeah? Pumping water. See, household work. Keep myself going otherwise, or get rusty. He fondly remembers how efficient the cantonment services were in times bygone and laments how much has changed. Okay. They do half, they go away, nobody to question. No one goes beyond that. Uh, okay. Yeah, it is so clean, so neat. Now it's gone. You get these youngsters coming in to say hello to you? Yeah, nobody, no youngsters here. Each one has got their own job. Not like before. <laughs> the youngsters are quiet nowadays compared to earlier times. Carol singing too is dying out. We don't go carol singing now because the school factor is there, timings are there. We do meet in Palavra, we have the candles carol by campfire. We meet in church, yes. But this going house to house and singing is gone because of the school uh, timing. Has. As we amble down the streets of Veteran Lines, we are filled with a serene awe at the timelessness of the place, its laid-back air, its quaint colonial hangover. And we pause to catch our breath as we realize what nostalgia it must hold for its residents, both past and present. My uh, dad's father, he worked in uh, Kumbakonam Hospital. He was a doctor there. And from there During they the came World back War and settled down in Palavaram. We lived behind the torch. The front of us were the Dillons. The other side of the Dillons was uh, in uh, uh, Colleen, uh, what was the name? Maddox. Maddox. And uh, the, the front near the recreation club was Lou Allen Brito. And uh, then you're going towards the school. Was you had Mrs. I think her name was Mrs. Wilkinson. She used to be the head teacher of Patani School. We had on the first main road the Mansfields, then the Tranfields, then the Hadfields, and uh, after that uh, was the military camp. On the other side. We had people like the Pereiras, the uh, Thomases, the Moreras, the Edmondses, the uh, Bentleys, and uh, the Pepins. Oh, robbing mangoes. Yeah. Oh, we used to go around with a catapult, shoot the mangoes off, and I can't remember the gentleman's name, 
but he used to always warn us that he had a shotgun loaded with saltpeter and if he ever caught us thieving mangoes, he'd you know, let us have one in the bun. But he never ever used it on us. Okay, he used to tie up all the mangoes with bags for most people. Every morning he'd come up to count the bags. Mangoes were good. Yes, no, he'd cut the mangoes and the bags back with the stuff. So in our house we have mango trees and after like 13 years we finally come back here and it's like my childhood like memories coming back all over again and recently it's mango season so everyone's climbing trees, climbing the walls, picking them. When we were young there were pound parties, there were like socials and dances and all where all Anglo Indians got together. We had a very good time. Sadly, that's not the condition now. I mean, many of them have gone away to different places to make their homes. But we still have a few. So and your partying must have gone on pretty late into the night. Normally, it used to go continue till dawn. Yeah, it, uh, that, was, that was the normal thing. Maybe around 5, 5.30. On our way back Saturday night, then on our way back, go to church. Sunday mass and then go home. At the time we had the recreation club and uh, Harry, Harry Mansfield he used to run it and uh, you know functions like uh, Christmas time we used to start on the 19th of December and used to go on right up the 31st uh, and we used to bring in New Year's dance and all that there. Well, I was only a youngster but we used to stand on the outside of the doors and watch the adults all dancing. Okay, so these dancing were held in open air? No, it was in the recreation club, which was the old army barracks. Okay. And, and the floors, we used to have to throw, well, the, the adults used to throw French chalk on the floor so that they could slide a bit better. Dance a bit better. And for how long would these dances go on? What time would you wind up? There was no time. Three o'clock, four o'clock, five o'clock. There was no time at all. <laughs> Until go on. Till we go for mass Sunday morning. Were the Palaram boys and girls good in dancing? Oh yes. You you uh, never run short of partners. <laughs> of course Howard doesn't dance, but I dance a lot, so I never ran short of him. And uh, if the Mount boys come over and if nobody wants to dance with them, then they talk to Howard and Howard will say, dance with them, how sad. That's Parish and all the Claudius boys. But they were nice, good dancers. And did you go to Mount for dances? No. I didn't have to because it, we always had our shows. Palavan boys and Mount boys, they never hit it off. So, we are like banned to go to Palavaram. If we go, we have to go in a big gang. We can't go ourselves. So, we prefer to stick to Mount. And where were these dances held, Howard? It was held in the military barracks. We, since we had good uh, contact with the army, they used to give us the military barracks. We had an association called the Anglican Association. The PRC, Palavaram Recreation Club, was the main thing, was attraction for Many people in Chennai wanted to come to Palavaram because of this PRC, Palavaram Recreation Club. It was all the Anglo-Indians was in that club. So every Sunday, we meet up as one big family. So what kind of recreation? Was it hockey? Was it football? All game. Hockey, football, oh, cricket, yeah. table tennis, chess, drafts. You think of it. We used to play all the games every day. Boys and girls on the military Maidan. We meet and we have our games there. And where did you play table tennis and chess? You had an indoor game? Yeah, room? we had. We had we had a house on Mr. De Costa's house. We had a table tennis in there. We had a compound there. In that compound, they'd be playing cards or they'd be playing uh, chess and drums or caroms. We'd be playing table tennis and stuff like that. Yeah. Harry Mansfield he used to run the recreation club. He used to also organize moonlight games on the Maidan opposite. The, veteran, the houses in veteran lines and all the boys, all the girls and Harry used to be there in control making sure we played crows and cranes. <laughs> you know, he'd shout crows or cranes and one way or another you ran and the other team had to try and catch you. 
and that. And the other thing which he used to do, he used to go around every house had to give a pound of something. A pound of sugar, a pound of rice, a pound of anything. And then you, it was all put together and at the recreation club, it used to be like a party for everyone. What about hockey, I ask him? He used to organise the hockey matches. That's the married men against the bachelors. Then you'd get the, the women dressing up as men and the men dressing up as women. And that used to be the laugh of Palavram. Indeed, the Palavram Recreation Club was much admired by Anglo-Indians across the city for its dynamism and many joined in its programs. They pay their subscriptions for the month, take part in the occasion, and they go back. So you're talking about the PRC? Yeah, PRC. Not the AIAIA? No, no, no. no. It was not in existence then? No, that came in just 20 years back, 25 years back. The PRC has been there for more than 60 years. Started by my uncle, Louis Starr. Uh, would you all go for picnics or? Oh yes, the PRC used to organize every year. One or two, we'll go to Kovalam or we'll go to some, it'll be a very nice, or we used to look forward for that picnic like. We used to have something called the Mini Olympics. It was a very grand affair for us, two months, every day. The Star Brothers, Howard included, were good hockey players. Howard recalls the top sportsmen of his time in Palavram. Gordon Barton, Dominic Star, Royston Star, Kevin Star, Patrick Star, Algernon Pereira, uh, Babe, uh, Babe Clayton Morello, Bastion. Clayton Bastian, uh, Don Jacob. They were all hockey players. All hockey players. I mean, all, they used to play all games. We used to make them play all games like Denver Moe, Robin Mansfield. Yeah. It was hockey. We used to also go to the Indian Airlines Stadium or to Veteran Lines. That was the only time I think the boys from Palavan and us did not have a fight. Otherwise, if it was a dance, we always did. John, there's one thing that's been tickling my fancy. Uh, you're from Palavo, you're about a half hairs from St. Thomas Mount, and those days there's a little bit of rivalry between Mount and Palavo. How the hell did you break the jinx? Well, le let's put it to you like this. Uh, rivalry was always there when we played against each other. But when we came together as one, there was nobody to beat us. So having said that, <laughs> My better half or bitter half worked for a few years as a receptionist in the company. And that's where when I offered her a, a drop since she was staying in Mount. No doubt it was uh, it was a bit taxing for, for the people, the boys on the other side of the fence. I know we, we did get into uh, quite some words over it. But I can understand, you know, the same could have happened if anybody walked into Palavram. But nevertheless, we are today all friends, even the same boys who wanted to give me a scalpy. <laughs> we are still friends. Because everyone reassembled in the recreation club and had the, without spirits in those days, was all prohibited. So no spirits. But he used to get the man coming around the back with the toddy. Auntie Paddy Ross and her husband, they conducted one, uh, an evening together and all the boys and girls who married within Palavra, she really appreciated us and we got some gift or something from her. She announced it, it came out in the annual report of the PRC, it was very nice. We supported it a lot when uh, Horace Ross was uh, the president of the association and uh, Patty Ross, she, she used to do an immense amount of work for the you know, PRC and uh, conducting the mini Olympics and uh, so on. Who was your best hockey player? Wendy Thomas. Herbie Thomas? Yes, his daughter. Oh, okay. Very good. Even Tammy also you know, used to play. Both the daughters used to play. But Wendy was a better player. We shouted out to Herbert Thomas when we visited Palavram in 2016. 
catching him by surprise. You like to see your sexy shots? We want to put you on TV. There you come in sexy shots. See? I'm coming from Anglos in the wind. What happened? He okay. has been a long-standing resident of Palavram, though most of his children are overseas. Herbert is now no more. May his soul rest in peace. There are very few Anglo-Indians left in veteran lines, and among them are musician Paul Jacob and his dancer sister Andrea, whose homes radiate an old-world charm. Uh, I'm Andrea Jacob, and uh, I come <coughs> from a family of musicians, dancers, a large family. Some of you know me personally. I'm married to a Sindhi, and we both have similar references with regard. We talk about this a lot because both our communities feel we belong everywhere. I enjoy movement and that's part of our culture. We are, as movement, we move a lot. And you always love to move a lot, whether it's dancing or whether it's being moved from your houses because you're Anglo-Indians, you have moved a lot. We can connect with any place because of one big thing our community has. One big goal, which we haven't yet tapped into it very well. The performers have, but some of the others haven't. It's improvisation. Paul was born in veteran lines, but left in 1987 to chart his career in music. By the time he returned in 2006, he had found that the place had changed. So it's a huge difference. I mean, a lot of people had left, of course, and, and, uh, but more importantly, the, you know, the, the, the nature part of it. See, uh, every house had at least three or four varieties of fruit trees which I don't see anymore. And uh, uh, when we were kids, it, it, uh, the entire colony was open. Kids would just run into anybody's house and you know, that openness is uh, gone. Um, and parents would never have to worry about where their kids were because they knew that they're, they're gonna be somewhere around the colony. And It was Paul's dad, Lancy Jacob, who was the first to travel by foot to the famous Church of Our Lady of Good Health at Velankani in 1973, a spontaneous decision driven by an anxiety instilled by doctors that he could lose his child or his wife at the time of delivery. Uh, it was really wacky because uh, uh, at that time dad had his own interior design business. So his uh, manager was, uh, was a Brahmin guy called uh, Padmanabhan and he said, Sir, you have never gone anywhere without me, I am coming with you. <laughs> so, and we had a neighbor who was a Protestant, uh, Peter Latoyle. Uh, he was the dad's drinking partner. He said, if you go, what am I going to do? <laughs> so, I am coming with you. So the three of them started off this, originally the three of them who started this walk no clue what they were going to do, how they were going to get there, and, you know. And they reached the main road and they started walking and at Tambaram they met this uh, old Muslim gentleman uh, who was walking up to Nagore, <coughs> which was just next door. So, in fact, the, the, the very first walk was unbelievable. There was a, there was a Muslim, a Protestant, a Hindu and a Catholic all walking together to 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 Valangani. <laughs> until then there were no walks. There was absolutely no walk to Valangani until Dad started it. Ever since then, groups of Anglo Indians from Madhavaram to Mount to Palavram undertake the ten day walk to the shrine to make it in time for the flag hoisting on the twenty ninth of August each year. Walk started by my younger brother Lancy Jacob. Okay. Oh. And I was reluctant to join him in 73. Okay. So next year, I was bashed badly by Mother Mary. Okay. And next year, 74, I said, I'm definitely on the walk. And by God's grace, carried on until today. So, and how many years since you have been walking? Uh, I'm walking. I missed one year, so it's 43 years. 43, that's wonderful. We also had a word with Lancy's two sons, visiting from Melbourne. So you have how many years since you have agreed, uh, done this work? Uh, I have agreed close to 31 years. And, and Steve? Uh, about 20 years. 20 years, okay. okay. So you'll find any difficulties in uh, walking and all those things? Uh, 
Uh, no difficulty. You just have to walk it. That's all. Right. Okay. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah. Let's tell me, tell me, Karen. So you support this walk? Yes, I know. Uh, in what way you support this walk? Uh, okay. We spotted the witty Rex Daniels who had stepped in to wish them well. He is the guy who is a flag bearer. He leaves right from the front. No one goes past him. Mm. Very soon in the night he put on a silver bell to keep mm. ringing in the night as they are walking <laughs> night for disco light. A great number of pilgrims, of course, do travel by train, including those visiting from overseas. I always like to go to Balankani because, uh, you know, we always pledge different things through the year for our children, you know, for ourselves. And But one thing, I have to make it a point to visit Balankani whenever I come, whether it be it for one day or ten days, it, it, it's a must for me and my family. In Melbourne, Anglo-Indians do undertake a pilgrimage in honour of Our Lady of Balankani each year, walking for almost seven hours from Tulon Vale to Bacchus Marsh. In Madras, those who cannot make it to Nagapatanam for the annual feast undertake a walk on September 8th to Our Lady of Good Health Shrine at Basinaga. The pilgrimage to Velankani is popular with non-Christians too. Uh, we strongly believe Our Lady of Health and uh, you know, we used to visit and uh, that's how uh, I used to, my, my parents and myself used to go to Velankani. And, uh, you know, anything to do with health, we only think of Our Lady. Do you or have you encountered Anglo Indians there in Velankani? Yes, plenty of them. I am talking about late, you know, 70s and early 80s. We used to have a lot of Anglo Indians coming from Chennai, from Goa. Uh, you know, they used to come and stay for a week, you know, and uh, they cooked themselves. Uh, I've seen them cooking and having food, full family. But back to Paul Jacob, who has helped bring folk music to centre stage in Tamil Nadu and elsewhere in the country. He has travelled with folk artists to premier cultural festivals across the globe and has won accolades for his efforts. He helped design and launch the Chennai Sangamam Festival in 2006 and before that teamed up with Earth Sync and folk musicians of the tsunami affected countries of the Indian Ocean for the Laya project, whose film won several international awards. I asked him about his association with the film world. I have, in fact, uh, been a music director for about uh, 10 films, <clears throat> and uh, most of it was uh, done with friends who uh, have understood the depth of what we were trying to do and wanted that kind of involvement with the folk artists and uh, so uh, and it's not just uh, Tamil I have I've done a couple of uh, Telugu films I've done a Bhojpuri film I've done one Hindi film and uh, quite a few Tamil films so uh, I would say that's a that's a different uh, world altogether not one that I'm very comfortable with indeed the community has contributed significantly to Tamil films over the decades, courtesy its musicians, technicians, and even the extras. In those days, a lot of Anglo Indians were asked to come to play side roles in Tamil films, especially the ballroom dancing, the band scenes, the bar scenes, the pub scenes, okay, the pool scenes. These were all which the Tamil group could not gather people to do these things in those days. So the Anglo Indian community that was always called, the cabs used to come to our house 5, 6 o'clock in the morning, pick us up, drop us back, we'll be given all our breakfast, lunch, dinner, we'll be given, we'll be paid some amount of money according to the number of hours we work. So all these things were there, facilities were there. And we really enjoyed those days. But today, since there's no Anglo Indian community, hardly anyone here, so those things also have gone out. But there are those who have bucked the trend. Actresses like Andrea Jeremiah and even Samantha, whose mother is an Anglo-Indian from Palavaram, have emerged as popular stars in the Indian film industry. I never thought of um, being, being, being an Anglo-Indian as being a disadvantage. Um, if anything, I guess uh, I had double exposure in the sense I had Indian exposure because I live 
here. And uh, also, I had a lot of exposure to the Western world, obviously. So in that way, maybe it gives me something of an advantage. Andrea Jeremiah has acted in over 25 South Indian films, besides being the lead singer for over 50 songs. Mention must be made of Nicole de Costa, who acted in a few South Indian films a decade ago. We also spoke to Genevieve from Pasawakam about her experience in the film and ad world. Director K. Balachandra introduced me into serials and ads, yeah, we began doing ads for, you know, home appliances and saris and I came to realize it was such a nice thing, you know, where um, it's something very pleasant and lovely. You see beautiful people, you, you get to kind of uh, uh, support your talent over there, you know, kind of, and feel good. Life is all about doing things you love ultimately, so this is a field where you actually get to enjoy your work. She has adapted well to South Indian culture. Even though I was born an Anglo-Indian and I love our Anglo-Indian way of lifestyle, the culture, the way we dress and everything, I must admit that I've gone to like the tradition of down south, you know, and I'm very fond of the Marisar, the Brahmin Sari, and so I got this role in the film Onion. You know, as uh, an Iyengar mommy, <laughs> as the heroine's mother. And I used to enjoy working simply because I got to like this Marisar every day. You know, they used to put this long thing, uh, braid for me and tie me up. And I used to be so happy. That was one I used to enjoy. But I think every single film I've done had something unique about that mother character. So. Beyond Sarah of St. Thomas Mount has scored a few songs for Tamil films. In the field of film editing, Llewellyn Anthony Gonzalez from Perimbo has been a cut above the rest, with more than 80 films under his belt, including the likes of Sevaji, Endiran, and Vinay Tandi Varavaya. And who can forget the all-time great cinematographer, Marcus Bartley, who is on South Indian Cinema's Hall of Fame. So Marcus Bartley and uh, Nagesh were very close, mm. and he also said, mm. he said, if Marcus Bartley uh, is given a time, like 8 o'clock, the shoot has to start, He'll be there by seven. Yeah. He set up his camera and everything. And if anyone, anybody comes even ten minutes late, he'll say pack up. Yes. He's very yes, strict. He was a terror. Yeah. yeah he was, he was a very strict. Yeah, yeah. Ah, because being an Anglo uh, guy, and they all thought he was a foreigner because he's a white-skinned yeah. man. Yeah, white skin, yeah. So he name. commanded that. What, what, what a lot of good movies he's made. From even I think uh, he has done Chemin, which yeah, won a uh, national yeah, 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 award. National, yeah. Yeah, international award. Then he has done uh, Chandra Lekha, no? Chandra Lekha, uh, I don't And then Nadodi Mannan? Nadodi Mannan. No, I don't no. remember. Maya Bazaar. Ah, Maya, Maya Bazaar. Bazaar. Maya Bazaar. Bazaar. See, that Kalyana that, Samir yes, Sadam yes, yes, song. Yeah. He was that, too good in was, that uh, special effects. Yeah, special effects. Kalyana Samir Sadam one song is there with the... the moon like all these uh, laddus uh, will go. One day called Rao. Open his mouth all and the laddus will go. go. I, that time, yes. it, what was yeah. the year that... Yeah, it's... Uh, a yearly 50s. 50s. Yeah. See, uh, 66 effect, no? years ago and you, he did a very nice effects. So all that was done by uh, Marcus. As he said in his interview, he set the trend. And in fact, he was the one who introduced Eastman Colour to the cine field. Yeah, I think he was, he was the one who handled yeah. the first. Place. Let us hope that after Marcus, we have Nicholas. <laughs> <laughs> one crucial talking point is how the community 
has been portrayed in film. See the community, which is a mixed race community, mixed blood community, has always been portrayed differently down the ages. Now, for example, in uh, many uh, novels, etc., the Anglo-Indian woman was a person of easy virtue and the Anglo-Indian man was seen to be a person who didn't like to work. Now, I can uh, explain this better with, refer with reference to Cotton Mary. The Cotton Mary is supposed to be a nurse. And you know, Anglo-Indians are very proud of their nurses. The nurse, Anglo-Indians were the first to enter the nursing profession because other Indian women would not touch men or they would not touch dead bodies or sick people. And Anglo-Indian nurses have been always, um, you know, we have won awards at, uh, uh, during, the, during war time. And the chief, uh, you know, we have headed the um, uh, military, um, nursing, I think, in the military. So, Anglo-Indian nurses, we, we have been very proud of them and justifiably so. And then to have, uh, to see an Anglo-Indian woman portrayed, not only as, um, uh, you know, a bad nurse, but also as a thief, you know, this came as quite a shock to the community. Indeed, Cotton Mary remains the most shameful film that could ever be made. And thanks to the efforts by the community in Kerala, by Gillian Hart of Calcutta, and De Monte of Madras, and Dr. Beatrix D'Souza herself, the film was effectively banned in the country. Cotton Mary did not see the light of day in Australia or New Zealand either. Dr. D'Souza was right when she told the BBC that the portrayal was nothing but cultural genocide. To be fair, there have been some fine movies made on the community, such as 36 Chaurangi Lane and Bhawani Junction. I like Bhawani Junction. I really like Bhawani Junction. Because apart from the fact that, you know, it has these good actors and this good actors and this Ava Gardner, etc. It showed an Anglo-Indian woman who started questioning her identity. At that time, at the time of independence, she started questioning her identity. Growing up in a railway colony, uh, where you know Anglo Indians are very Anglo Indian, and th that's why she decided to wear a sari and even get married to a, a Sikh, etc. As far as the book is concerned, Victoria actually runs away from the Sikh marriage ceremony. Well, I think uh, you know the way the author has portrayed the protagonist Victoria is is something quite remarkable. So I think um, you know it goes through a lot of. Questioning times uh, where she, in, in her life where she has to make certain decisions, and the way he's brought out those different aspects of her char character is uh, something that's uh, quite intriguing. Though well written and perceptive, the book is quite laced with prejudice. Interestingly, in these and other movies, such as the Malayalam film Chatakari, the protagonists have all been the Anglo Indian woman. Dr. Shamasri drew our attention to the character Edith in the Bengali film Mahanagar by Satyajit Ray. She has been represented as an icon of modernity. She has been represented as a girl who will do anything. That means she will do anything that is honest, that is upright in order to, uh, in order to you know, run her family. But so, she not... so Satyajit Ray was way ahead of his time in recognizing these absolutely, virtues. Absolutely, absolutely. Satyajit Ray was much ahead of his time when all the other uh, filmmakers were focusing on the stereotyped characters of Anglo-Indian women. Satyajit Ray's film represents something really different. Shamasri has done her PhD on select Anglo-Indian writers. I have referred to renowned authors such as Irvin Allen Seeley and Ruskin Bond. Along with that, I have also referred to the lesser known ones who have written their debut novels or just they have published their autobiographies such as Keith Butler, uh, Esther Mary Lyons, David McMahon, Jimmy Pike, and of course, Alison McQueen. And how do you find the writings of these authors? Um, I'm, I was quite astonished when I uh, read their novels. They write very good English and they bring up the stories of their communities through uh, their personal narratives, right? So their community narratives are at the same time their personal narratives as well. And through these narratives we come to know about certain facts about the community which we don't know in our day-to-day -day life. And personally, how do you identify or relate to the community? I feel that I 
I, as a researcher, uh, I feel that I am a part of this community because of the support, the friendship that I have received from the Anglo Indians whom I know. The book by Esther Lyons is a very interesting one. Shirley Dial, a retired teacher in Madras, remembers her stint at La Marte near Lucknow, where Esther also taught. La Marte was a big fortress with a big uh, with turrets and uh, basements and drawbridges and moats. It was quite frightening. And I was very nervous. And Esther was really a very naughty girl. She used to dress up like a blue lady and frighten me. Because it seems one day in the night, the blue lady visits La Marte. Interestingly, Esther Lyons has written a short story on the Blue Lady, which has been published this year in this book of Anglo-Indian ghost stories. Our next halt in Palavram is the St. Stephen's Anglican Church. St. Stephen's Church is integral to uh, the uh, veteran lines. Actually, the church itself was uh, built on the funds raised by four Anglo-Indian ladies and they are remembered in the plaque that is there right in front of the church. Adjacent to the church is the St. Stephen's School, whose classrooms were once horse tables. We stroll across the road, and here Brian gets animated. What was it called? Lofa's Bridge. Oh. All the fellows would come sit here. Yeah. Both sides. The, it, the water used to come from there, underneath. Okay. Oh. There was a bridge here. Okay. The old man Dylan used to run and I used to sell. You could go there, you could buy your cigarette, you could buy bits and pieces from him, fishing line. And he was a great fisherman, old man Dylan. He used to make up parties of all of us and he used to lead us down to the river. The Palavram branch of the All India Anglo Indian Association, which includes the locality of Tambaram, has been quite an active branch. I do make time to go for the association meetings. One thing is the connectivity between the community. There's a lot of life, a lot of happening over the, at that place. And we have these, uh, we went for a picnic recently. Then we had Christmas gatherings when we were planning to have one for the Easter. And Justin De Silva, then Clayton Bastin, all these are People who are really, you know, they take all, all the youngsters, they call them the little children, make them dance, teach them dancing because some of us are, most of us are married also outside the community. So pulling them back together, teaching them everything, teaching them our culture, I think it is a must. The youth are going to be the future of the association because in another a few years from now on, we are going to be naturally a big vaccine. So and let the youth come forward and give them and you know guide them and not leave them alone just guide them and help them to see that you know they are able to manage the responsibilities that they take from the branch how many youngsters more or less are there in your branch we have around around 40 youngsters in our branch how do we want to kind of embrace the change and see ourselves our children so i mean i make the point with my two boys to um to see that they they do have they do participate in these kind of events that we have or get exposed to the Anglo Indian way of life. And my parents, my sisters as well do the same. Uh -huh. You know, my sisters do the same with their children. So I think it's it's for us to keep that going. Uh, touching on the uh, national national youth meet, you know the NYM. We had the NYM one first one we started in Calcutta two years ago. <clears throat> then last year we had it in in Pune. And this year they are going to have it in Bangalore. So this is NYM3 and every year the numbers seem to be going higher and higher with the branch participation becoming more and more. The youth we are focusing on is leadership, education okay, and then uh, commitment to the community. Justin, I, I know that this must be taking at least half of your time, your living time. What motivates you to do so much for... Yeah, motivation is first is the love for the community. Second is the school that taught us to work for the youth. I, I, I studied in St. Beads, Salishans. Founder was Don Bosco, and he was the father of the youth. And from there, we got that uh, initiative. We got that, you know, that, that uh, what do you call that, you know, drive. drive to work for the youth. When Justin De Silva took over, 
Uh, he made a lot of change in the Palavaram branch. He brought in the elders' lives. He brought in picnics. Then he brought in Christmas functions. And uh, apart from that, we used to have a food fest, which all of us used. And elders' life was the special because all our members used to cook the food from there and take it and go. All our community members are very active. They play their part and then we have a kind of system where we give everybody their own jobs to do and they do it in a good way. Apart from uh, uh, socializing um, or giving a regular scholarship or just a pension, there's a lot more that could be done for the community in terms of building it up. Just because I said a word like that, a sentence like that, they should be a warning letter. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you a copy if I got it somewhere wrong. So that means, that means you are not active now? No, I'm not. I, even though I was just an ordinary member, I used to do a lot for them. Perhaps I think on a couple of occasions when you came, I used to run the housing for them. And you know, introducing people for the dance. I, I, I like that. I like the entertainment part of it. You are the president. Yes, for that seat, we respect you. If you are an entertainment secretary, if you are the secretary, yes, we like you. But that doesn't mean to say we should call you sir. No. Sir is a word which is used only for those who are knighted by the Queen of England. And Clayton used to, Clayton Bastion, he used to, you know, be very active. He used to get the community together. He used to, you know, conduct some sports. So he was a very nice person. And then Tina Bastion, uh, sorry, Tina Tully. Tina Tully, if I'm right. So she used to, you know, uh, also joined in, her sister, and uh, they were quite, uh, you know, they kept the community together. Clayton Bastion has served for 25 years in the association, including 17 years as an office bearer. He remembers meeting Frank Anthony as a youngster. Then he asked Mr. Paisang, Irvin Paisang, his best friend from Chennai, he asked him, what Mr. Paisang, any problems in uh, Palavaram? And Mr. Paisang also didn't say anything. But I had a very pressing problem and I put up my hand and he said, yeah, young chap, you from, from where you are? He said, from Palavaram branch, my name is Clayton Bastian. I, I said, and in Madras we are having this problem, Jailalita said, everybody has to learn Tamil, it's compulsory from the time they go into the school, LKG from LKG they have to study Tamil and I said this is our problem, I said in LKG we are teaching our children ABC where we have to teach them our children in Tamil. It started off very well, uh, I mean, it was represented by Frank Anthony as a very enigmatic leader uh, and since then you know, we should probably look to go to go further and, and you know, onwards and upwards. We had a word with Barry O'Brien about the association. And it's 140 years old and the only way forward is to work through one organization because organizations are beginning bigger than individuals. Today if you look at Barry O'Brien or Neil O'Brien or Frank Anthony, they are minuscule compared to the All India Anglican Association. I don't know whether it's possible to appeal to Anglo Indians, please come. We are with open arms welcoming you. We want to embrace you, we want to accept you as members. Come forward. All the members of Palavaram branch and Tambaram people combined, they don't have any hitch about paying in one go the yearly subscription. The minimum is 20 rupees and the maximum is 62 rupees per month into 12, 12 months. Now a child was doing 10 standard. Yes. What is the kind of scholarship you will give such a child? Child who is doing 10 standard, he gets a meager amount of just uh, 780 rupees from the center per year. And, and, a, and a child who is doing uh, arts uh, graduate, she, she gets uh, 3600 rupees per year. But at the same time, BSc nursing, and doctors and engineers get 15,000 rupees for professional courses. But what's so special about the Palavram branch? I asked Clayton. I love the branch and uh, I love the people and I feel all the children are my children. And I make it a point, whomsoever I meet when I meet Anglo Indians, I ask them if you're a member of the association, yes, come in and join. Because when I came here to Chennai, I did not know that, you know, the, the, that is such a big association because I belong to the Adia Basanaga Parish and we don't see that many families there. The Anglican Association is trying their best to get everybody in. 
okay. But but because of you know because of the nature of jobs and their timings and all those things, it is little difficult. So though we have about 480 members in our association, at least we are able to capture about 60, 70 percent. And everybody comes and enjoys and has a nice time, and it's, and it's quite expensive. But all our functions are done in a subsidiary. Wilfred was instrumental in helping revive the Pondicherry Willapuram branch in 2017-18 and was awarded the Member of the Year by the Association at the national level. Thank Sherlan, especially Shivan, for taking up this task and she's really doing a very good job and today they have something like three of flags in the bank in the span of one year. Very good, very good. Wilfred is concerned about the youngsters in the community. They, they don't have patience nowadays. Youngsters. They want everything in, in quick style. You know, because you know, because they have gone used to their computers and laptops and uh, cell phones and all. No? So they feel even life also has to be like that. But there are those who are go-getters. The other day I uh, met up with two youngsters. Uh, one is uh, Fabian Daniels. He's the son of uh, Stanley Daniels. And he was proud to know that he heads a small division or part or department in HP. And another young girl whom I'm proud of is Steffi Bastian. And uh, she works for Amazon. And she heads the risk management uh, department. And she's up for a promotion. She also, uh, she went sometime in November to Costa Rica for a training. So this is something that I'm proud of because you can see our youngsters, they have not, they have not uh, gone for you know, the local trades, but they are looking at something higher. So there is opportunity in India? There is opportunity, especially with the MNCs that are here now. Ian's own daughters are doing well for themselves overseas. Crystal is a pilot in Canada, while Candida is a budding pastry chef in the UK. Both of them are real gems. Both my girls, I'm proud of them. In fact, if you, if you go up to the terrace, I can show you two bonsais. One is as old as Crystal and the other one as old as Candy. Most Anglonians love to keep a garden at home. What are your favourite plants, Paul? See, the rose, the variety of rose that are available here. Hibiscus, jasmine, and you have the sweet william. We have the ragged robin. So you're fond of flowering plants? Yeah, box flower. What's Bilomori. it called? Bilomori. Okay. Bilomori. Yeah. But it has to be in the sun, right? Yeah, well, unless you give sunlight, uh, get sunlight about 8 to 10 hours, okay. then only it will flower. Even the bougainvillea is so pretty there. You have pink and white. You have to trim them, right? Yeah, you have to trim them, then only they'll grow. It says in John 15, you know, I prune the plant so it'll get better. <laughs> Many in the southern side of the city shop for plants at the Palavram Shandi, which is held every Friday, not too far from the airport. In 2018, the Palavram branch organized a career guidance program where about 25 youngsters and even parents were present. Now it is the right time, you know, after seeing this Palavram work that they are doing, I think this is an eye-opener. We have to get together and stand back to back with each other and we have to make out some novel ideas, some innovative things. Like I was discussing with you, we have to start some coaching centers for our people alone. Uh, we have to push, we have to make them imbibe the best knowledge and see that our people uh, come into all the departments, heading the departments. I think it's, it's for us together to see that we're able to support those who are less fortunate, those who need some guidance, those who need mentoring. Um, so I think you know for for the younger generation to know that there are different opportunities available, uh, they need to be shown all that in terms of uh, what's there and that and to have a support network and support system. I certainly feel that there is a lot of scope for our for our youth, especially our Anglian youth. Still, there is a lot of uh, potential in hospitality business. Uh, they could really climb the ladder fast because of their ability to speak English very well. Secondly is that if, you're really, if you really want to make it in life, you have to make some sacrifices. Ian believes that young professionals are best placed to advise others. Let these youngsters who are in a position to be sitting on stage, because when they say how they reach this level, then the youngsters who are coming out from college, they know Okay, if he can do it, I can do it. 
Now, if you and me are to sit on that stage and lecture to these youngsters, they say, oh, these, you know, those, those days are over. I don't know why our guys don't join this field. There's a dearth for copywriters, English copywriters, in India, as in across the country, Mumbai, Delhi, Bangalore, Chennai, of course. You know. We've been hunting for a writer for almost three years now. I've just managed to get one. As such, no writers, but I don't know, I don't know why they don't come into this field. It's natural. Somehow nobody has that vision of, you know, I want to build a career here. And what about youngsters and sport, we ask? All Anglos are good hockey players, good football players. I don't know why they don't make use of the talent we have in football and because hockey. the schools are not encouraging yeah, them before. Yeah, that's one thing like. But otherwise, you know, I think uh, the, committee, the association can do something and we can pull it out, like, bring it like, big at night. We can form so many good angle hockey teams. Youngsters continue to fare well in one sport or the other. Jessica Burley of Palavram has excelled in martial arts on the international stage, Annie De Rosario of Roy Potter is a budding karate kid, while Chelsea Persich of Mount is the top junior discus and shot putt thrower in Tamil Nadu. Nearby, bordering GST Road in fact, is the Alstom Company, formerly called English Electric, dear to anglo Indians who came here to work from several parts of the city. And because of Alstom Company, people, all Anglos were working there in those days. So you can say those days, 65% was all Anglo and only English electric. Like all the Anglos who were in Plavrum worked there. Plavrum, Mount, Thamrum, they worked in English electric. Like that was one of the main attractions was this company. Were you also employed in English electric? Yes, for 23 years. And what was the nature of this company? What kind of work? What did you make? It was mostly uh, doing you know, electrical equipment like for transformers, circuit breakers, uh, PC, PC blocks terminal blocks, meters. So these are all the main used to export mostly. And a lot of Agnanians at that time working in English Electric. And we used to get together and have a good time and go for movies straight from work. Sometimes we'd take a half day and go. A great bastard, I can tell you, was one of them that uh, Ronnie had made, uh, Dickie Williams and Harry Pears and, you know, uh, Stanley Cobb. How in touch with any of them? No, I had one Desmond Collins was the only one that I met when I came back in 2010. We ventured closer to the church area where hardly a handful of Anglonian families now reside. You can count them here. You can play Bledger, Narcissus, Bernard, Van Alten, as far as I can count at random. We had the Narcissus, Bernards, Gomes, they pledges are also there. Pledges and all are just come now. Pledges, Greenwoods, just come in. When Alton's were there, and the stars were there, and I think uh, that's how we got talking, and he was very close with my uncle Raymond Brett. So. Marion Starr stayed behind the St. Francis Xavier's Church, where her grandparents, both maternal and paternal, built their homes after relocating from Villapuram. Mother's family and father's family came into Palavram in 1954. Then they yeah. fell in love and got married and then they started their family. Daddy was in Dunlop. Mummy was a statistical officer in railways. Her husband Howard has been closely involved in church services over the years. Born and brought up in St. Francis Xavier's Church. Baptized, first of the communion, marriage, both my kids baptized there, both um, got a person to come in there, marriage too should be there now. And what made you choose Palavra? <laughs> my root is here, my wife. <laughs> she's, a, she's a girl from Palavra and uh, her f whole family is here. That's right. They have five sisters and three brothers and she's the eldest among the of the sisters. What's her maiden name? Her uh, maiden name was Greenwood. Oh, okay. Ba Patricia Greenwood. And uh, you know, in, in Tamil it's difficult to say green mood, so they call it the Pachakate. <laughs> Are you fond of Palavram? Yeah, very fond of Palavram. I've been here for so many years and uh, I can't find a better place. I was uh, married here, my children were christened, my children were married here and uh, that's what makes Palavram so special. Mention must be made of Michael Gallio's daughter Vanessa Hopkirk. Based in Dubai, 
She is manager anti-doping for the International Cricket Council. Palavram has also produced a number of Anglo-Indian priests. Yes, Desmond Daniels, um, Setu, uh, Setu, Kenny Setu. Kenny Setu was from Palavram? Yeah. Father Ed Brito from, was from Palavram even, another Palavram boy, Father Brito. Father Edgar Morera. Edgar Morera. Behind the Catholic Church is Griffith Street, which was in its time given a new concrete road by Dr. Beatrix de Souza, former parliamentarian, out of her constituency funds. We caught up with Walter Narsis, a retired Post and Telegraph's employee who stays on the street. We worked on Mars. So that was an art. It was musical to listen to when you get a good sender sending, you know. The music, it is like music. And it becomes a second language also. Now too, if I sit by a, in any post office and I hear a, a, a person working on their skis, I'll be able to decode those messages. So it was interesting. And then the teleprinter came. So when this telegraph was wound up recently? This, uh, they wound it up a few years back. Uh, three years, three because years. Because they ago. found, you know, this WhatsApp came and uh, cell phone came. And naturally it was no use. But did it break your heart? It was, a, there was a sadness. I still feel we sh they should have kept the telegraph to go on. Because in case you want to send a message, it is an official document. Up to the 1960s, most of the Telegraph employees were Anglo-Indians, and Walton remembers some of his friends. Ivan Dikona, uh, Tony Jasmi, Tony uh, Jansen, then uh, Ivan Rosario, Tony Lawrence from St. Thomas Mark, and uh, one boy, Cedric Windsor, studied with me in St. Mary's in the, 50, in the 50s. The Telegraph ball was famous, wasn't it? Yes, they had the Telegraph Ball, they had the Telegraph Recreation Club and uh, most of the Anglo-Indians represented the Indian Olympics from the Telegraph Recreation Club. John Murphy was one, Eric Blankley, the, whose name I remember, then uh, a few others. Walton also told us about his early days in Palavram. Mm -hmm. I came here in 1972 and the land was sold by one Mr. Eric Pope. He was the owner of all this land, single owner. So he was going away to Australia, so he got the land plotted out. And whatever I get on it, he says, I'll take it. 4,000 a ground. And this is more than a ground, 40 by 75. 4,000. So I happened to come to Palavram and some person told me, Wally, they're selling land, yeah, Eric is selling his land. I told my wife, I came and saw it. I said, okay, I'll take a plot. Swimming, we used to go to Pope's Well, right? We used to all go swimming in Pope's Well. We all learned how to swim in that well. I mean, there were steps going down there, right to the bottom. And, uh, you know, the, we thoroughly enjoyed all of that. And then go to the paddy field on shooting trips and all this sort of thing, you know. We were staying that side by the market. See Vasan Garden, the Shaul Amit Street. Then when I got married, we bought this house downstairs. We paid the, that uh, loan in five years. Then we built upstairs. And we are staying Who are your friends who you, uh, whom you are still in touch with? I am not in touch with any of my friends. And only when they come down from Australia, Canada, Germany. And who are they? Can you name, can you name some of them? Bomi Edmonds. Then one Sean Pereira from Australia, then the Robson boys from Australia, then one boy Wells from London. They are all my childhood friends. Reggie and his wife Corina have been running a popular hostel for working men and the inmates are grateful for their kindness, especially with regard to the food. The roasts, the vindaloos, the scoped and rice ball, curry, tell stew, bone pepper, do you name it? And I prepare it, so that's it. Okay. You must be getting irritated with all this work. No, no, no we, we enjoy, enjoy it. Enjoy what we do. That's we it. We enjoy what we do. And uh, actually, we both had different careers. He was a musician, Reggie, and uh, I was working for a software company. I was a manager administration for okay. a software company. Okay. And once I finished off from there, then we both decided to work from home. Reggie also has a cold storage for pork. Kind of a just done. Oh, okay. Yeah, 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 okay. So that means uh, uh, Swiggy and all come pick up from here, right? Yeah, yeah. They come pick up raw material, 
they come pick up a lot of this, our Anglo dishes and all. Today I made coconut rice and ball curry. Ah, okay. Some 25 plates they took. <laughs> okay, okay. How much do you charge? I charge 140. For, for coconut rice and ball curry together? Yeah, and huh? chutney, devil chutney. Oh, okay. So a lot of people in order. That's good. We don't a lot know. of Indians, they order my food. Most of okay. the Hindus only are coming to my shop. Raji was formerly a guitarist with the famous Palavram band, the Scarlet Sensations. Who are the other band members with you? Raymond, Johnny Fernandez, then uh, Trinity Lazaro, Gerard de Nazareth, Travesta. And your crew now? We all crew. Oh. We never had any girl singer or anything. We only crew. And the strength of our band was our voices. All the boys used to sing. That's the main thing. But a uh, big occasion came was when we played for Hopfield. Or played at Hopfield. That was the break that we got. And of course, we played for many years together. We didn't have many changes in the group. In fact, we had additions. And uh, I guess as life goes on, we eventually had to wrap up because boys were getting married, boys were migrating or leaving to work in the Gulf. So eventually we wrapped up. But when we meet on certain occasions, that, that old feeling comes back and the sing song is put together again. So it must have been a full time job almost, as it were? No, 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 no. no. It, was, it was only a hobby. It was only a hobby because everyone worked. Before Scarlet Sensations, of course, there was the Moonstones. The Moonstones by Clifford Phillips, was the lead guitarist, Noel Ingram, Tony Hatfield, Raymond Brett, Raymond Brett the drummer, Brian Gorn, Alfie Gorn. But let's get back to Veteran Lines, where a whole world seems to have almost vanished. It's very sad. You go to Veteran Lines, that was really oh, sad. Mansfield. Yeah, Mr. Mansfield was there. What was he? Horace Ross was there, Jerry Pereira, Tony De Nazareth. Now, of course, now Lionel has come and uh, Jerry Rosario, Tony, Tony Hatfield. Several houses are now deserted, forlorn and in ruin. Their owners have either emigrated overseas or relocated elsewhere in the city. Others have been sold or taken over. Even the two local hockey grounds, once packed with teams awaiting their turn for a match are now unrecognizable. One has mounds of earth while the other is overgrown with shrubs and infested with reptiles. But none of these have dampened the spirit. This place is something different. This place is something unique. This place is a heaven on earth. My sons are very clear in their mind. They do not want to get rid of this property, come what may. We very much agree and can even hear AAs to that. But most of these voices are now on distant shows.